Hello and welcome. I'm delighted that you're here in my studio in London, just a bus ride away from the major galleries. I'm Anne Witheridge and I've been teaching art in the atelier tradition for 20 years. I trained first as a painter in Italy, but before then I studied history of art at Christ College Cambridge. As well as teaching students in my own art school, I've been invited to do painting demonstrations in many of the major galleries, including the National Portrait Gallery in London, the Dulwich Picture Gallery, the Watts Gallery, and often at Leighton House Museum as well. Over this course, we'll be looking at paintings and drawings and sculptures and seeing what we can learn from the masters of European art and painting. The process will be really sequential. We'll start off with drawing from sculpture casts, looking at shapes and proportion, and moving into values, or lights and darks, and slowly incorporating colour and pastels and oil paints. Today I'm really excited that we're going to go to the National Gallery to look at Van Gogh's painting of the chair. I'm going to be joined by Shirley, who's one of my former students, to look at his painting and his techniques before we come back to the studio to translate it into our own painting. So we're very excited to be here at the National Gallery and it's a huge privilege to be able to film in front of one of the most famous paintings that the National Gallery have of Van Gogh's chair. Shirley. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. I just, I think I'm gonna got lots of uh, inspiration from here today. It's really a pleasure to be here at the National Gallery to see the original painting by the master. This gallery has countless famous paintings, beautiful decoration, carved patterns on ceilings. It's really worth a visit to come and experience it. I'm sure you've all seen pictures and reproductions of the painting, but here it is in the flesh and we can learn so much from it by seeing it up close. First of all, we can see the canvas that he used, which is really exciting. As artists, we often want to take the paintings off the wall and look behind. Here you can see he's using a jute, which is quite a thick canvas, and he's left it on the side, but amazingly, he's also left areas of the painting untouched. And I'm sure he didn't plan to leave certain areas untouched, but as he paints, he only paints what's necessary. So the paint is incredibly thick. It's literally like a 3D sculpture of the paint, but not all the canvas surface is covered. So we can see it all down here and along lots of the edges. When we paint, traditionally, I was always taught to paint in terms of lights and darks to really look at the values. And the really exciting thing about Van Gogh is he isn't painting shadow shapes and light shapes. He's just painting the light and just painting the colour in the light. He really is using coloured light to create the image and to create the painting. There's lots of talk about the subject matter and about whether it's a melancholy painting or a happy painting. I see it as a very happy painting. And there's lots of symbolism about the chair, but I'm sure as he was painting it, the chair ceased to have significance and it really became about the colour and the paint, making the paint jump out. The way he puts these brush strokes down with thick loaded brush. So when we're at the studio later, we're really going to remember to squeeze out lots of paint and load up the brush and paint with these thick impastos. Shelley, can you see how thick the paint is and how yeah. exciting it is? Yeah, I really like the texture, textures and the thickness. That's right, the, the, the texture, but also it's not arbitrary, it's not messy painting. The way the brush stroke is put down in different directions really helps create the form. And then he's got some really quite flat passages, like this shape here, which makes this leg, the foreground leg, really jump forward towards us. The wall in the back as well, that's really built up in a nice flat manner, but the paint is still really thick. Whilst the door, lots and lots of vertical brush strokes that makes us want to go through the doorway. Another thing which is really exciting is the edges. There aren't any actual edges. He hasn't drawn out and coloured in shapes, but he's got accents of colour. And the accents of colour aren't the realistic colour of the chair, but rather the blues that are around the painting to really make it harmonise. So there's the yellow of the chair in the doorway, and there's the reds of the floor along the seats in the background between the door and the wall. And then there's the blues of the background and the door 
along the edges of the chair. So it really makes everything sing together. To me, it also could easily be a landscape with the sky above and then a wheat field and the earthenware down below. So it, it really could translate into every, any subject, into still life painting, into what people call a displaced portrait because he isn't there, but it says so much about him. Shelley, what really strikes you by being here in front of it? The original painting is much bigger than I imagined. I've seen pictures of it online and in books before, but it doesn't look that big. And the texture and thickness of the paint are not clearly visible in pictures. So it's very exciting to be able to see the actual painting, to see how the paint has been applied and overlaid with brushes. So when we're thinking about Van Gogh's painting, he really, for me, the most important thing is the amount of paint he uses, which we can really see here. Like it's, it's really quite astounding. It's kind of glooped on the paint. It's, it's so beautiful and exciting, just, just as a surface. So even as a piece of abstract art, it's beautifully balanced colours and really nicely built up. And then the vibrancy of the colours, the colours are much more intense than any wooden chair that I've ever seen. So he's really pushed the colours beyond because the colour, the, the chair is, you know, under life size. So he's pushed it so, you know, we come into the picture plane and the picture plane, plane comes out towards us. The other thing is his, um, his use of accents to make the painting really sing. So the colours he uses to balance and complement the colours, like you know, this very strong blue here next to the dark accent there. I think you know, dark accents are, are more obvious, but even in those dark accents, he's used a different vibrant colour. But using these light accents along here is really beautiful to me. He's also got some of the knots of the wood in here, which I hadn't hadn't noticed until I've come here to the gallery, the, the lovely little details and just how much attention is given to the, to the straw as it goes along the form. He's really painted to describe the form. It could literally be physical straw, couldn't it there? Um, this is a really nice artwork. Um, what, uh, what is the significance of it? So the significance of this painting in the history of art is that it's the use of colour, the way he's used colour. So he hasn't used colour in a naturalistic way. He's really pushed the colour. He's actually made the painting more about the colour than the subject matter. Not only has he pushed the colour, which other artists had done, but he pushed the coloured paint. So he's literally physically using coloured paint to express an emotion, to express a mood, and to give us the, the shapes of the object and the space around it. So really the, the painting could be beautiful in, in any terms. It's, it's not just because it's a chair. Actually, the subject matter could be seen as quite boring and, and quotidien. Whereas the paint, it's the quality of the paint and the depth of the colour that makes it a really amazing and inspiring painting. So these colours are intensified, they're more chromatic, they're more saturated and they're really thickly put on. But it's the relationship, it's the audacity to put the, the blues and the reds next door to each other and put that thick, thick chrome yellow paint just globbed on. And the same with coming down the chair here. When did this painting uh, create? Because it looks like a modern painting. Yes, I mean, it was painted in 1888 which is um, incredible, you know, just a few years earlier his paintings were very monochromatic and, and much duller in colour, so he really did a huge shift and he was also at the same time doing lots of pen and ink drawings. So the fact that he was doing all this and then came down to the south of France and suddenly it was like his eyes were illuminated with the amount of light and colour. I mean, the 19th century painting is, is very naturalistic and artists were just starting to break away, but they were still, they were breaking away with the way they used paint and kind of the visual language, but they were still painting naturalistically. But this is really pushing the boundaries of what colour is and how we perceive colour. We're both really excited having seen the painting in the flesh. It really is amazing. And we're going to take it with us in our minds and remember everything so that when we go back to the studio, we can really do a translation of the paint. We're going to do our own setup and we're going to use this as an inspiration. We're not copying the painting, we're copying the way he uses paint. And that's the key to Van Gogh's work. It's really about how he uses paint and how he translates colour. 
So he's not doing anything completely naturalistically. He's really adding an extra emotional level to everything he does, both with the thickness of the paint and the use of colour. We had a wonderful time at the National Gallery looking at Van Gogh's painting with Shirley. Wasn't it an amazing opportunity for us? Yeah, it's very exciting. Very exciting. And now we're back at the studio and we're going to try and recreate a similar setup. You can be very liberal with the setup. It really doesn't have to be perfect and mine is definitely not perfect. He also changed quite a lot in the setup. So the onions and the pipe were added much later, three months after he did the start of the painting. I found some pieces of fabric with similar blues I found an old chair and really the most important thing is it doesn't have to look exactly like the painting. You're getting an idea and we're translating how he would have translated the similar subject matter. Does the light very important for the setting? Well, you want a sort of a flat light, which usually I like to work with a strong chiaroscuro, which means a dark light setup. But he worked very flat light, so we've kind of done it more, more flat, so there aren't exciting shadow shapes because he was much more interested in the colours. Does the quality of the paint really matter? or Not really, no, you can use any quality of paint. And he was using um, both very cheap pigments and he was very experimental with his, with his paints and oh. using paints that hadn't been used before, which created some fast uh, quality issues with his paintings. But I've got a mixture of good quality and cheap quality paints. So in terms of the colours he used, I've, I found kind of a good range of them. The colour range is from light to dark, which is how he would have laid it out. But at the end of the day, the palette is a complete um, menagerie of lots of colours. So he used um, titanium white and zinc white, uh, and then yellow ochre, raw sienna, and these are earth pigments. And then he had chrome of yellow and cadmium yellow. Cadmium yellow is metal based, whereas chrome of yellow is uh, a synthetic material. Cadmium orange, vermilion, red ochre, which again is an earth base, emerald green, which I've never used and I'm excited about using, it's, it's a very vibrant colour, um, ultramarine blue, which is very standard, Prussian blue and black. And he definitely wouldn't have used all these colours at all at the same time and he would have supplemented it to other colours as well, but he was very generous with the amount of paint he squeezed out. So um, I can be quite mean with my paint, but I'm going to be very good and squeeze out a lot because the main thing about his paintings is you can see the thickness and the impasto, which means thick paint. He used an awful lot of light, like it really is the light colours he, he used and he was tinting with the darks, but the, the light paints is where he kind of builds up the thickness of the paint. I encourage you to use cheap quality paints because you're more likely to be experimental and to be more generous with paint and the key to painting in his style is to be very, very generous. He really used paint rather like sculpture. As I put out the paints, I'm putting them out from, from light to dark and it does make it easier, more logical. And even though you know, he, has a, he doesn't work with a lot of darks, he doesn't work with shadow shapes, he definitely uses a lot of accents. So it's really important that your darks stay a little bit clean and clear so you don't get the white and the colors in, in everything. You want to kind of have your dark area a little bit more organized. These are the, the colours. Um, there would have been other ones as well, but this is titanium white. He also used zinc white, but they're very, they're very similar. And this is yellow ochre and raw sienna, and they're also incredibly um, similar. This is just a little bit lighter. This is a cadmium red and a uh, sorry, cadmium yellow and a lemon yellow. And it's really just about temperature change. So you've got a cool yellow and a warm yellow. I mean, I'd say his colours are much warmer than they are cool. Um, so the, this is actually red, vermilion red and um, cadmium orange, but they're just tiny little shifts in, in the temperature. Here it appears if they're all the same, but this is ultramarine blue, and the um, Prussian blue looks very much like a black, but it's an incredibly vibrant, strong colour. And this is black, which can be really nice, not such so much a colour, but kind of to control the temperature if everything gets a little bit too exciting. So I'm going to put these down below now and grab my oil. So he would have used um, linseed oil, which is really the vehicle. So we call it the vehicle because it helps the paint move around. To be honest, these paints are quite cheap, so they, they're quite kind of oil dense anyway. So you might not need much, but a couple of them, like the vermilion, are good quality paints, so I might need a little bit of oil to, to help them move around. So lots of artists work with um, turpentine, but that thins the paint. And the one thing about um, Van Gogh's painting is he doesn't use thin paint. It's very, very thick paint, which is built up. So probably not even that much 
oil, but it's just if the paint is a little bit too stiff, like my vermilion red, which is a really good quality, so it's a little bit stiff. But most of the paint is um, so loose and well mixed, we can probably just mix that paint by itself. So I'm going to move the trolley around to my right, just because I'm right-handed, so it makes it easier for the, for the painting process. Try not to spill the oil at the same time. And you, want, you do need a good light on your canvas and on your palette. And the reason why artists, and Van Gogh as well, held their palettes was because of the glare. You can get a lot of glare, which is difficult to see the colours. So you can hold it, but um, you can also indulge yourself if you're in the studio and put it on a, on a nice table. Uh, why are you painting the canvas first before painting? So he would have prepped some of his, sometimes he would have gone out into the field and done the painting straight away, but often he would have prepped it before with a warm tone. And actually at the base of the um, picture, if you remember looking at the gallery, there was a nice dark, ready warmth to it. He was actually painting on something called jute, which is a, like a thick weave, like a linen, but um, he also experimented with linen panels as well. This is just a really cheap cotton canvas because um, you know, working on jute is very hard to find and also linen can be difficult to, to find, though it's a much nicer surface. And I think he can get that effect of thick paint because he's on the jute. So this will be a little bit harder, but it's um, easier to be less precious if you're working on something cheap. So I've mixed basically the red ochre and a little bit of ultramarine glue together. And I've also made the surface quite messy and loose, just so that in your mind, if you have a perfect surface, you might be tempted to work perfectly and we want to try and work really loosely. So I think the way you prep your canvas is, is really important. Do it also the day before so that it's not wet. So if I go like that, it's kind of a little bit tacky, but it's not sloppy wet. You want it to be dry surface when you, when you come to it. What types of brush are you using? Ah, good question. So the brushes are hog hair, which is uh, pig hair. And he would have used hog hair, even though they had lots of sable hair and mongoose hair as well. And I do have, I actually prefer working with um, ivory, which is a synthetic blend. I'm going to use hog hair today, which is what he used. And he also used um, not very good quality brushes. They were very old and he kept on using the same ones. So really you don't have to worry about the type of brushes you have. What you don't want is really beautiful watercolour brushes or soft sable. You want slightly hardened ones because it's easier to load up the paint and put it onto the canvas. So we're ready to start the painting. I always have tissue in my hand to wipe the brush clean as I go along. The first thing is the drawing, so really working out you know, where the shape is of the chair. And the chair is quite large, it really fills the canvas space. I'm going to start just with ultramarine blue and a little bit of red ochre on my brush and a little bit of oil just to keep it nice and fluid. So in terms of the drawing, so this is the really the main construction. And you want to think of it really simplistically as if the chair is in a box. Don't think of it as a chair because it makes it much more difficult to draw. And he was really looking on top of the chair as he drew. Um, so if I think about the end of the painting, it will make you much more anxious about the painting process. You've really got to think about the start and just think about the big shapes. There's the, the chair. And you can hold your brush up just to get the angles correct if you want to, to really see this. And he was quite fussy about shapes, actually. He, he kind of thought it a really important part of it. But the lovely thing about oil paint is that it's really forgiving, so you can move it around. So don't think that the marks you put down are fixed there. And you also think about the amount of paint he's doing. He's permanently editing and making the colours more and more rich and vibrant. So there's the chair, there's the break in the wall from one space to the, to the next space with the blue. His um, little box he had, but he actually added the, the onions much later. Um, and I'll indicate where it's going to go, but I won't worry about that either. So the next thing is to think what colour would we put down first. So the chair is quite warm and the ground is also quite warm. So what colour would you think you'd put down first, Shirley? Uh, the floor? Well, the floor is very similar to what I've already got down. Mm. So actually it would be better to put down the blues. And I think this painting, the setup is very much like one of his landscapes. You know, he's got the colour of the sky is like the colour of the back, the, the fabric, and this could be, you know, a wheat field in the foreground. 
So first of all, we've key the sky. So everything you see in nature is because of the colours of the sky. And he was very much a landscape painter and got very invigorated by the sun and the sunlight. So he would probably key the, the sky first. And the really important is not to work with a tiny brush, but get a big brush so you're really brave about putting big shapes down. Also, when you put the blue down here, it's really lovely when kind of the accident of the base colour comes through as well. So you're not, you're not a painter decorator, you don't have to cover the wall perfectly. Actually, you've got to build it up in a really nice, lively way. So as we start the painting, we've got to really remember that we're not trying to replicate the painting. We're using his techniques and his materials to do any setup. You could just do a still life setup. It could be, you know, some onions and apples on a blue fabric in your, in your kitchen. It doesn't have to be the chair. I've made it similar, but it's not exactly the same. So I'm going to start off with what I think is the least like the setup. So really the canvas is slowly going to become truer and truer to what I see in nature. So I'm going to start off with this big blue here. And that's obviously too um, cool. I want to make it much warmer. So I'm going to have a big dollop of ochre into that as well. Mixing the colour, if you, if you don't think you've got the colour correct, don't just carry on slapping it on, like put it down and then decide whether it looks good. So that ultramarine blue by itself, I could see immediately that it wasn't quite correct. So I've added a bit of ochre and white into it. And um, I'm really easily pleased. <laughs> so I think it's nearly correct. But also you can't tell whether a colour is correct until it's got its neighbour next door to it. And the more you build up the paint and the painting, the more exciting it, it gets. Is that um, all artists like you already do this before paint finish the whole painting or just Van Gogh? I think Van Gogh, the way he started the painting was very much like all artists. You know, first of all, you think about the composition and the relationship of um, colours, but it was more in, in his kind of further on when he kept on applying the paint and kept on putting it down. But also the main thing that differentiated him from most artists prior to him is that for him the colour was the subject matter rather than the subject, rather than the, you know, the objects. It wasn't about the sitter or about the chair, it was about the relationship of, of colour. And also in the history of art, most people had trained from working from plaster casts, so colour wasn't even part of the subject. It was about light and dark, or we call it values, whereas he wasn't interested in the values. He was making the colour in paint the, the subject matter. So this is kind of the, the base, and I'm now going to go into this slightly more vibrant um, green. I've used the emerald green, and that is really quite wild. Um, but I'm sure he would have gone more wild, and his colours were more vibrant than was what, there, what was there in nature. So I know the chair is in this space, but I'm just going to put a thin layer here where the chair goes on top. The other thing is he didn't mix perfect mounds of flat paint. What's really beautiful is if you, if you over-mix with a palette knife, I think it can deaden the paint, whereas if you keep it like this and sometimes it picks up a little bit of the green and sometimes a little bit of the yellow and it makes it much more lively to see the colours. I am conscious of the fact that in order to make the chair jump out, I might need to go a bit darker around the chair space. And does it matter if we start with dark colour or light colour? Or That's a really good question. So it's much easier to lighten a dark than it is to di darken a light. So it's better to go a little bit too dark as um, if you try and put a dark accent on top of light paint it kind of gets merged into the into the light paint which is why I suddenly realized I needed to darken this a little bit. So really the, the chair is underneath here but I'm not really worried about how it pops out because I know I can edit it so much. I mean we like to go straight away now and put lots of thick paint down but you don't want to put too thick a paint down just because you've got to do the drafting of the of the chair on top. So I'll come back now and do a bit of drafting of the chair. So in um, Van Gogh's setup, the, the chair is much lighter than the background. Whereas in this setup, it's much darker than the background. And for me, I find it really hard not to paint what's in front of me because I'm so trained to paint what's there in nature. So I'm not going to worry about it too much. I'm going to put down the darker chair, but put highlights where the chair's catching highlights on the, on the top ridges. Um, and this is, remember, this is just the start. We've got layers and layers of paint to put on top, so you mustn't be precious at this stage. Just really, the most important thing is you really enjoy the painting process and applying the paint. So he was a very prolific painter and he painted a lot of paintings. And I think this would have taken him 
uh, you know, at least a couple of hours because he would have been building up the painting, getting very excited about it. But because it's in the studio, he could fuss about it a little bit more. So perhaps the drawing took a little bit longer. Whereas when he's out in a landscape, what I love about landscape painting is you're limited by the weather and the time. So you have a much greater energy to, to paint the subject. You know, you've got to rush with the clouds and with the changing weather. Whereas here, it, you know, the subject matter won't change. But I'm sure he put his same energy into everything that he painted. That's what makes his paintings so exciting. But if he wasn't a landscape painter, I don't think his indoor paintings would have had the same energy. Like, you know, he definitely borrowed the landscape, the weather of the landscape into his indoors as well painting. So I'm first of all just finding the structure of the chair. And I'm putting down, obviously the chair isn't this dark, but I'm putting the darks down to put the lights down on top of it. And I think this is a little bit too wide, so I'm just going to shorten it, I don't worry about that. And I often um, squint down to just simplify the, the subject matter, it makes it easier for me to, to see it. So the really, the most important thing is that you enjoy the paint, like he really, it was, you know, it's not about the subject matter, you start off with the subject matter and then the painting itself becomes the subject matter. Like all previous artists where the subject matter was always the key thing, whether it happened on the canvas, for him the paint became the subject matter, you know, the paint quality and the colour in the paint, which does make him really a phenomenal, a phenomenal and novel artist. Shelley, do you tend to draw more or paint more? Um, maybe draw more. Draw more. Mm. Well, drawing is an incredibly important part of the painting process and I think Van Gogh was a very skilled draftsman and he did lots and lots and lots of drawings. He did many more drawings and pen and ink drawings than he did um, oil paintings, but he only had that fluency with oil paint because he drew so much. So you really do draw an awful lot at home, but when you translate it into painting, don't be intimidated by the colour, really enjoy the experimentation of playing with different colours. So I've never used this palette before and I'm just going to really enjoy it and if I don't get the colour right, I can put another colour on top and I think that's really very much his technique, it's building up the colours on top of each other and you get the accidents of painting is what makes painting look really, really rich. If we get it precise straight away, it can look much flatter. That's very useful for me because I I always very focus on the shapes and to build it well, but I think this part is more fun. Yes, you've got to realise that the shapes come in the process of the painting. You have to have confidence that the shapes are underneath it and that the build-up of colour is going to create the, the shapes. Yeah. So I'm now going to go for the, for the seat. And I am using a different brush every time, and I think he would have used lots of brushes um, to try and keep them even though they all kind of the pattern of colours wants to be throughout the painting, you still want to use um, lots of different brushes to keep them more or less clean and clear. So for the seat, I'm just using pure ochre with white. And I'm thinking, I think he does a lot. I'm not just thinking about the colour and the value, which is the light, you know, how light or dark it is, because the colour is the value and the temperature. I'm also thinking about the direction of the brush strokes, and his paint is very much, it's very sculptural, so it's really thinking about how he lays the paint down. Um, and it's really important as you put the paint down that you don't, don't just one brush stroke and then load up your brush grain. Don't kind of go over the same area as it really flattens the paint and makes it look a little bit more boring. Really go and lay it down and then leave it. Trust it, trust your brush stroke. So when we looked at his painting, we also saw that all the colours were chosen throughout the painting. So it wasn't that the background was blue and the chair was yellow and the ground was red. There were blues borrowed from the background in the chair and on the floor and there were reds in the background. So everything really harmonises and balances. And if you're outside landscape painting, the colour of the sky dictates the colours you see everywhere. So all the colours are jumping around, which makes it much more exciting and lovely to see. So I'm just going to borrow the blue from here into the, into the chair legs and it will make it look much, much more interesting, I think, I hope. If 
I actually used a little bit of red just to kind of balance the colour and to bring us into the, into the painting a little bit more. And I'm really, when I put my paint down, I'm really scooping up the paint. So I'm not just kind of meanly touching the surface, I'm scooping it up and ladling up the paint onto my, onto my brush. I think often we can be really mean with the amount of paint we put down and not use enough paint and it's really important to, to enjoy the paint. Um, I've used lots of downward brush strokes but I remember from looking at the National Gallery that the brush strokes in the background were really such a thick impasto, so really thick paint and they weren't directional. Whilst on the seat and on the floor they were very much more constructed to help describe the space. Whilst when you're painting the background you're not painting the wall, you're painting the space between the chair and the wall. So you need to build it up a lot, a lot thicker. So I'm going to put more paint down. Use up all my white on my canvas and have to squeeze out some more. Uh, normally how we decide what colour to mix together to get what you want? That's a very good question. So when you look at colour, people think that colour is a very complicated subject, but you really want to look at colour and say, what is the hue? So the hue is the name of the colour. So in this case, it's, um, it's you know, a green, but it's a greeny blue. And is it warm or cold? The temperature is much more important. And I think it's quite a warm colour, but it'll look more exciting if it has cool and warm. So remember that we're not painting a flat surface, we're painting relationships of colour. So the red underneath, because red is the complement of the, the blue and the greens, it really will make the colours sing a little bit more. So start off with the colour that you think it is, the green, and then use, I've used the white to calm it down and soften it, and also the ochre because it's a bit too sharp, the, the emerald green. And so for the dark side, I'm using more ultramarine blue. Amazingly, I've nearly finished my ultramarine blue, so I'm going to have to squeeze out some more. I'm going to add a little bit of Prussian blue, which was that really strong, sharp blue, just because it makes the colours even you know, happier and more fun to have some strong colours. And I think that's one thing about Van Gogh, if he definitely enjoyed colour and he kind of enriched it. I'm sure his, his walls weren't as exciting in colour as, as the walls he's painted for us. So I feel now I need to go into the floor because I've said enough about the... Um, the chair, though I think this is looking a little bit wide and I'm just going to happily shovel it over by putting a brush stroke on top. So you can see how easy it is, how easy it is to edit it and also that it doesn't matter. And you often get some lovely accents in editing a painting. You'll get some shapes you hadn't even anticipated and you'll add colour. You know, so the little mistakes you make add, you know, mean that some more interesting colours pop up in different areas of the painting. Um, the floor to me isn't exciting at the moment. It's, you know, that's just the base of the canvas that we started with. So I need to put some colours. I think this is the hardest bit, is when you've got to not change the colour but just add more paint. You know, it's very easy to edit, and that's the most important thing with oil painting. It's all about the editing process. But just um, adding paint to it. So I've got to edit it whilst making it more lively. So now I'm going to paint the floor, and I think the floor is probably the hardest thing to paint because the base of my canvas is so similar to it, but I need to add more light to the, to the floor. And again, I'm, I'm dipping my brush in a lot of um, ochre with a little bit of raw sienna to put some lights. But you see it hardly, I mean, it changes it more from here, but I don't know whether you can see it, it kind of just adds texture to it. The floor will get more exciting when I've got a base of paint down and I can add more colours into it from the, from the background, more of the greens as well. So um, something which I found very amazing when I looked at the painting up close is how little shadow shapes he had. It really is all about the colour and the light, but you can't have no shadows. And what he has instead of shadow shapes is much more accents, so little lines of dark to kind of lead our attention into certain areas. And also another thing which was really interesting is the accents were never in the same colour as the big shape. So if the big shape was the blue, like along here, he had warm accents travelling through there and a little warm accent here. And on the chair there were accents 
of bluer colour. So that makes it very interesting and keeps the painting much more balanced. He also led our eye into the painting with some green at the bottom corner and a little bit of dark to lead our eye into the subject. Because if you had it just a red tiled floor, it would fall off the page. And this little dark in um, art history, they call it the repoussoir figure, but he did it with colour, just leads, pulls this surface up. That's actually too cold. It was a much um, warmer green, which helps lead us into the picture and also helped kind of create the, the tiles as well. He also had this little box here, which balanced with the, with the rush seat. But you see, I'm really just using, you know, one brush stroke to describe something, which is a really fun way of painting. And do you see when I'm holding my brushes, I'm always holding them at the end. I'm not holding them like a pencil. I'm not drawing with them. I'm really painting with them and I'm using my shoulder. So I'm standing away from my canvas and he definitely would have not sat there up close. He would have stood away and got excited about his painting. And when you stand away, you see the whole of the picture. It's not about the little detail. It's what the whole picture adds up to. Um, I usually use acrylic or gouache to paint the paintings, but they dry very quickly. Um, is, are they the same stage and same methods to... So I would say that um, you can definitely use acrylic paints um, and you could also use gouache. Um, really the foundation is about the drawing. Oil paint is very for forgiving, but it's also quite messy. The really lovely thing about gouache and acrylics is you can build up the paint. I wouldn't advise using watercolour because it is actually one of the most technical painting medias to, to use and it's much harder to be free with it because you can't carry on editing and editing but definitely use um, acrylics instead. I mean I love oils and he painted in oils um, and I haven't painted much in acrylics just because I find it less, you can manipulate it less by oils really are an incredibly forgiving medium and we can carry on editing it and I think his whole process was about the building up of paint and the editing and, and the freedom of paint, the freedom that paint allows you. But you have to have just a certain amount of skills, of drawing skills, just really getting those shapes down and understanding the big colour patterns. So really simplifying it. He wasn't painting the detail, but the whole added up to something really exquisite because there's still, it seems very simple, but it's actually incredibly sophisticated, all the kind of the balance of colours and colour harmonies and the temperatures that really went throughout the whole painting as, as we saw at the National Gallery. So as I put the lights on top of the, the chair, on the wood bits of the chair, the lights only work because of the neighbouring dark. So you can't just put the light down. So you have to, you know, it's all about the relationship of colours and paint application. And for me, this is a very big brush for these shapes, but I think using a big brush really forces you to be loose and freer with your paint. Don't, don't work with a small brush because you tend to get more into the little minutia and the little drawing. So you know, it forces you to use more paint and to be a little bit freer about the shapes. I'm just going to squeeze out some more paint. What's really amazing in Van Gogh's time is his, um, his approach to painting, his visual language and his translation wasn't even understood. Like most people didn't understand the way he was painting or why he was seeing that way, which to us was so accepting of that way of seeing and we, we relish it. And the very fact that he kind of put colour as a more, that, you know, that was his main and most important subject, wasn't even a concept back then. You know, it was very, very novel to think in that way. And he was really revolutionary. So, you know, often we can put the painting down and see it as, you know, really loose, but it was an incredibly novel way of thinking and a really exciting way of thinking. And I wonder how I would have reacted to his paintings. Definitely down in the south of France, they, they weren't very kind or positive towards him. And we've been talking about his um, sense of light and sense of colour and how much he relished colour, but his early paintings are actually very dark and quite really based in, in value patterns. And when I talk about values, we're talking about lights and darks. And people talk about how it's his Dutch you know, upbringing. He was born in the Netherlands and grew up in the Netherlands. And you know, his influences there would have been much darker palette. And he really needed to move to the south of France. He needed to chase the light, you know, to see these wonderful colours. And then he interpreted 
the colours. Um, but his first few paintings were, were not popular and, and very dark, though they're also equally as, as beautiful. What's amazing about him as well is he had a very um, busy life and he had lots of different jobs. He was an art dealer at one stage and he was a school teacher as well. And he, he did a lot of work before he came to painting. He only started painting, even though he'd been drawing all his life, he really only focused on being a painter much later on in his, um, in his late 20s. Uh, so, but it obviously been a thought in his mind the, the whole time. So every time I go into the paints, I kind of mix up new paint and um, I'm doing it in a very slapdash and immediate way uh, and his approach would have seemed like that but it was very very thought out as well it was very constructed and even though it was based you know with a lot of his energy and his excitement about the colours and kind of really making the colours vibrate he would really be conscious about you know every brushstroke and, and where it was placed it wasn't that he was just scribbling all over the canvas and when you're painting, you're not working, you know, you don't work from A to B and see what works. You're working from which part of the painting looks least like the truth. So you're really kind of tr trying to capture the truth. But his truth wasn't the truth of the subject matter or, you know, the truth of the sitter or the landscape. It was the truth of the colour. You know, what colour did he see and how excited did he get by it? And, and really it's the, an effect of light and, and the light source. Um, as we see before his painting, like he usually used very short brush, uh, brush strokes. Does it matter if we learn from his painting to use the same kind of brush stroke style or we can use our personal style? Ah, so yes, definitely use your, um, I'd say like in the purpose of you know, learning, try and use uh, his brush strokes, but they could be very thick brushes as well. And sometimes like in the background, you can't see the brush strokes. And then sometimes he was very thoughtful about the brush strokes when he's creating um, the rush of the chair or the kind of the molding of, of the chair or the kind of the tile. So that it's really thought out. So I think try and do both. I would say, you know, in terms of learning, it's best to see, you know, what you can learn from him. So I definitely, wouldn't usually use such big brushes, but I learn a lot by being that free, even though you know part of you inside thinks, oh, I really want to stay with the drawing, but you've got to trust his, his method and why he's doing it so that the, the colour becomes the most important subject and not your, your drawing. So you don't want to be precious. I think we can all be a little bit too precious. And we always say, you know, everything about learning is about the process and not the product. It's not about getting a pretty picture at the end, the pretty picture is just the result of you trusting a process. So that's the process always is more important. So I'm looking at the painting as a whole and seeing what area needs more focus and needs to jump out more and what needs to make more sense. So if we remember from the National Gallery, even though the, all the colours were beautifully balanced, it really was about this front leg that was jumping out a lot more. So I think I've got to go and build up some more light and make it really pull out a little. The perspective of the drawing of the chair is, you know, not completely accurate, but it gives it much more um, space and it really leads us into the painting. So I'm going to build out the, the light on that chair. And do you see when I put this brush stroke down, I'm not putting it following the form, I'm going against the form to try and explain that, that roundness of the leg. So the direction of your brush stroke does actually matter. So with this seat, I kind of did it to explain the rush and here I'm trying to explain this leg. The white that I added was a little bit too strong so I've added some cadmium yellow to look at, make it look even more um, vibrant. And remember every time I'm mixing up a new mound of paint, I'm not carrying on so that my brush doesn't get muddy and all my colours are still separated so you kind of have fresh clean paint as you work. He definitely borrowed a couple of the blue accents from the background into the rush chair and, and the reds of the tiles just to give it some stronger little accents and shapes. Um, some of his drawing was actually very specific where the spindles meet the legs. It was really well drawn. You know, so you can, you can, only, be, you can only be so loose with your paint if you also have some really well constructed drawing as well. It can't all be um, slapdash. So in order to make the light of the chair jump out a little bit more, I'm going to add some more darks underneath, some more of the red tiles. I see from my painting that actually the box I placed a little bit too low, so I'm just going to push it up a little bit. You see how easy it is for me to, to edit it up. 
So what I'm slowly do, doing is I'm trying to slowly both um, draw a little bit better, intensify the colours and get the colour relationships going ev even stronger by trying to balance them. But I'm using a little bit of values, which is the, the lights and darks, which he did. He, you know, he was also thinking about the value relationships and the, and the colour relationships. As Van Gogh's um, painting is very emotive, like what kind of these colours represent his kind of sense of emotion at that time, do you think? Well, I think that these colours, which you, you're completely right, they are very um, emotive and, and he used colour in a very emotive way. And I think yellow was his favourite colour and he saw it as representation of God and light um, and, and life. And so I think that's why it's got a lot of yellow in it. And this was, he was very excited about um, Gauguin's arrival. Um, and this was a, a self-portrait, like a displaced portrait of himself, you know, his, his chair in his ideal space you know where he was about to have this amazing community of artists it didn't it didn't come to that but this is kind of all his dreams at once and i think also it really does represent the landscape around him and the colors in the landscape so um uh, and how he saw the landscape like obviously the greens and the blues weren't as intense and as that the whole time but you know compared to the netherlands and coming to the south of france it must have seemed very intoxicating to him all, all those colors and and that richness so he really was using um, colour to express the painting, um, but also coloured paint. You know, he was really using the paint as, as a subject matter and really loading up his brush um, in a really beautiful way. I really like the rush hair here as I've done it because it's kind of let through lots of the warm colours underneath. But here I could carry on building up the paint. You don't want to build up the paint in, in the wrong area. You want it to be in, in the subject matter still. Um, I'm going to put the, he had a little cigar, I've got a hammer and a bit of, and a little hanky, but it was a, he had a cigar and a tobacco pouch in his painting. I think putting that cool white will really help bring out the colours around it as well. So I think the initial stage is really exciting of a painting, you're putting it all down, and now it's really much more about the tweaking and making the painting more, make more sense. So you have to step away from your painting and see it as a whole and how does it work and is there any part of the drawing that you don't like, is there any part of the colour balances that you, that you don't like so much. Um, I feel I need to rise this up a little bit more and I'm very happy to, to edit away. It's quite fun because I have in half, you know, I'm looking at the subject matter which is a subject matter I wouldn't usually choose. And it's a type of light, you know, the flat light that I wouldn't usually choose. And I'm also thinking about the painting we saw at the National Gallery. I'm trying to kind of merge the two. So when he was painting, he wasn't painting to be true to the subject matter in front of him. He was being true to the light and the relationship of colours. And we can really see that in all of his paintings. They're not, you know, utterly naturalistic paintings. They're much more emotive paintings. And he's really using the colours to to touch some emotions and to make us think in a different way. So these brush strokes for me were a little bit too um, vertical and it made it a bit dull so I'm kind of breaking them up a little bit so that they're creating a bit more atmosphere. You know, so this is a kind of a, a vertical flatter area whereas this kind of wants to be breathing area so it kind of sits it further, further back. And here I'm not representing a tiled floor, I'm painting, you know, the coloured fabric, but I'm kind of doing a little bit in between, so I haven't made it as purpley as the floor. Um, I've made it more like, like a tile colour, and a little bit of tile shape, but also just enjoying the, um, the shapes that are there. Uh, when we mix colours, do we need to like mix more to use? Or just, because sometimes I just mix a little bit, but next time when I want to use the same colour I need to mix again but sometimes it can't get the same colour. So I think that that's, that's a very good question. I think you should mix you know more than you think but also it doesn't matter if you have to remix it and the colour isn't exactly the same the second time round because if you look at Van Gogh's paintings they're not kind of flat replicas of true colour. They're completely vibrant interpretations and emotional you know, um, reactions to lots and lots of colour. So there's no way that he was representing you know, the flat, boring wall colour. He was giving it so much more life and he was you know, letting his paint live. You know, the colour in the paint was really alive on his canvas. So you know, 
if I were to take this forward, it's really about keeping on balancing the colours and trying to get a really lovely effect that way. But you do have to have quite clean colours on your palette. And his palette, on one level, it looks um, dirty, but it was also very clear as well. So even though he was really excited about paint and using lots and lots of paint, it was still quite controlled. You know, it wasn't just all expression and no control. You know, he did have a good training and he did know what he was doing with paint. So for me, I think in terms of uh, editing the painting, these greens are quite cold and they're a little bit warmer in nature. And these greens especially, they're a little bit too cold. And it's because I'm using the emerald green that I'm not used to and I prefer sap green, but that's no excuse. I can still edit it and I'm going to try and edit it to a kind of a warmer green using more ochre, which I've also amazingly run out of. So now I've put down big amounts of paint, but I need to start tidying it up. And this is the tweaking stage. I think it's, you don't want to deaden the painting, but you have to really draw people's attention in by adding accents, accents of dark and accents of light to make people think, oh, this is where she wants us to look, or this is where the, the artist wants us to look. And I think his painting, when we remember looking at it at the National Gallery, really had an amazing sense of little accents. So it's not all arbitrary and big splashes of paint. There's really lovely focused areas, like the base of each step of the chair or the, the ridging of the chair. Not so much the, the pipe or the box of onions, which were afterthoughts anyway, but really just little accents in here and in here. So that's what I'm going to work on now. And for me, it's not such an exciting phase. Like the most exciting thing is just throwing it all onto the canvas. But this is an important phase and it's really the editing. I feel that the green here is, is way too cold and I should have warmed it up a little bit. Some of my greens do need warming up. So I'm gonna add a bit of ochre to the emerald green. Sometimes in my own paintings, if I didn't like an area and I didn't like the colour, I'd scrape it off and start again. But he definitely isn't an artist who scraped off. He would have built the paint on top of it. And you get some really lovely little accidents happening because of that. So in the reds, I added warmth with the greens. And I want to warm this up, but I don't think it would work so well adding the greens. Actually, in this area, I think it would look better if I added some of the reds to warm it up. And again, I'm always rolling my paintbrush in the paint to scoop up as much as I can. You don't want the paint to end up all down the furrow. You want it on the tip of the brush and you can really use that paint like sculpture. So I want these lights to jump out and they can only jump out if they're next to a dark. So I'm going to put the paint down more solidly. It's difficult when you like an area of the painting to, to paint around it, but you've got to not be, not be frightened of losing what you've already got. And really using the paint, you know, finding the negative shape of what you find interesting to really help you find that shape. And I'm amazed looking at just how much detail there was in his painting here. I'm just going to try and create it with little flicks of dark moving up. So I loaded up my brush with the red ochre and a little bit of ultramarine blue. And I'm taking the dark that's here and just flicking it into the seat to kind of help create the direction of the seat. And because the paint's wet, it has a, if you, if I put it on and then did it again, I'd be putting the light paint from here into it. So every time I reload my brush up. And I think that's effective. <laughs> So obviously this is the front of the chair, so it's where it's more important. You don't want to do the same effects back here because then it would bring this too far forward. So you've always got to think about how we come into the picture. So this has obviously got to have the greatest light, that leg, and then slowly lead us back. So the same with the amount of information. You want to put more information in the, in the front of the chair. So often when you're trying to make something really jump out, and it's not jumping out enough or as much as you'd like with the colour you're putting down. So in terms of this foreground leg, I really want it to jump out. Sometimes it can be because the colour needs to be more intense, so more chromatic. So chroma is the Greek word for, for colour, so we use it to say colour intensity. So more chromatic, I need to put a bit more cadmium yellow into it or chrome of yellow into it. Um, but also perhaps the neighbour next to it needs to be darker and cooler and in order to get that effect of warmth and foreground in the chair next door to it needs to be cooler 
and darker. So it's all about relationships. It's really important you don't overdraw the subject. You, know, you keep it as a painting. You don't suddenly you know, go back to what you feel comfortable in drawing lines, but you keep on um, accenting. So a an accent is very different to an outline. There's a huge difference between an accent and an outline. So actually down here, I remember from his chair, and we do see it quite solidly. There's some really lovely dark accents, but they're not the same red. They're more like the, the black bit of, um, I haven't got a pipe, I've got a hammer. So I'm going to use a little bit of black in it as well. So even though I'm doing these really specific little parts, I'm still not drawing like that. I'm drawing, you know, I'm really using my shoulder to draw and get those accents in. I've completely forgotten about the back leg. So I can put the accents in, but I also need to put the shape around it, the lighter shape, to make that jump out even more. So something which is well drawn doesn't mean that it has to be linear. You know, well drawn is not linear, it's about, it's about placement. So it's a placement of a shape. So in nature we see in terms of light and dark and we see colour and we see mass, shapes of light and dark and shapes of colour. We don't see outlines that are, that are filled in. So really remember that as you draw, to kind of draw the shape, not the line. I think also if you use a big brush, you're much more likely to work with mass rather than line. Um, and Van Gogh was definitely really working with um, mass in colour and then with little accents on top. I think I need to do more to this part of the chair. I kind of find these legs so exciting. I'm not so drawn by that, but it still needs some attention. Yeah, he actually gave a lot of attention to these shapes that I've completely ignored. I've just done, you know, the whole thing is made up of six brush strokes, so I really do need to go and focus again. So I'm using the background, this paint here, to, to edit the shape. And I'm definitely looking partly at nature and my setup, but also kind of recalling the painting and thinking how, how he did it. And you know, do have a reference of the painting. So you're kind of working from both. So eventually your painting um, you know, becomes the subject. So you, you're using this really as a, as a reference and a guide, not, not a slave to this painting, to the setup. What's amazing about painting is, is once you start um, falsifying the colour a little bit and borrowing the colours, you know, the greens from here into the chair, you literally start seeing them in, in nature. So you kind of, you, you know, you force yourself to be adventurous with, with colour. And what's amazing is your eye starts reading those colours and you start seeing, wow, they really are relating. And it's not just, it's not just me being a, an over-coloured artist. So the greens in the, in the chair start making sense. You know, when, first of all, if you started painting a green chair, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense, but they, they start to make sense because of because of the balance of the painting. So I think we're definitely at the stage where the painting is making more sense in my head than the, than the setup, and the setup is really slightly irrelevant now. I often say that the most successfully figurative artists are the most abstract artists, because really you're not looking at the subject, you're looking at the way light falls and the way colour falls and the relationship of colour and temperature. When I started the painting, I was really thinking about the big shapes and I did a setup. We, we went to the National Gallery and we got inspired by Van Gogh's technique and the way he approaches painting. And I set up something similar, but it doesn't have to be similar. It can also be a still life subject. But think about the colouring of the subject. So it's really important that the, the colouring is similar because that's really his, his main skill and, and what we know him for is is really colour rather than kind of heightened reality at all. It's, it's, a, well it's, it's his heightened reality, his heightened interpretation of colour and intensifying colour. So it really pulls you into the subject. So we're really pulled into the painting of the, of the chair. And obviously this is under life size, even more so than the one 
at the National Gallery. So you have to kind of heighten that colour even more to draw you in. So the first thing was um, just doing big shapes, blocking out the big shapes. And now I'm slowly heightening the colours where I think it's necessary, perhaps pushing the values, which is the light and dark, where I think it's necessary. And also adding a little bit more information and refinement on the drawing. So for me, the drawing was always there and it's always there at the bottom of the painting and you're slowly pulling it out by refining colour. So if we really think about Van Gogh and what we can learn from him, it's one about being really generous with paint and not being precious about the paint. Trusting your drawing skills because your drawing skills are, are all there and just see it as a really simple shape because really if you put the colour in the right place, then the drawing will come out. So it's really trusting the relationship of colour, but also enjoying getting excited about the colour. So the colour doesn't have to be the colour that you see, and it's not about local colour. So when we talk about local colour, it's the colour of the actual object. We're talking about colour and then the space between us and the colour, which has you know, atmosphere, environment, light splashing around the room. So there's so many more elements to colour and the relationship of colour. So if you pull in a little bit of the green from the background into the chair, a little bit of the yellow into the chair, into the background, everything starts balancing. And also as you paint like this and you put more paint down, you should get more excited about the painting process and the possibilities of, of paint and the, um, both the emotional and the kind of the physical possibility. You know, it really feels much more like sculpture and the more I paint, the more I'm scooping up the paint and placing it on. Like you literally you can look at the painting, you know, it's three dimensional as well as just a boring flat plane. When I look here, there are little accents underneath the, the chair legs, which is why I'm putting them, them in. Uh, but he also had them in his painting. Whereas on the blue bit of fabric that I'm looking at, there isn't really anything exciting, but he has the doorway and there's got some little yellow accents. So I have added some yellow accents to make it fun. And the shift between this plane, this side plane of the door to this one, I've put some little red notes in here as well. What's amazing is the floor, a lot of my floor is still my first ground, it hasn't covered it at all. And in his painting, there's a lot of the side of the painting is just the start, the, the jute ground. And you can use the patterns, I've got it in my carpet, or he had it in the tiles. So he's borrowed you know, the grout. I'm sure he didn't have bright green grout where he was living, but he's borrowed the bright green of the background for the grout on the floor. As you're painting, it's all very exciting and I find it really kind of invigorating. But in your, in your mind, you know, what's going through your head is really just, it, it isn't the chair or, you know, the fabric behind. It's literally what colour do I see and what shape do I see it and how do I load up? Like really, it's, it is very much about how I load up enough on my brush. I did just put this very flat shape in because I saw um, in his painting there's a really flat shape. and. If everything is jittery and wild, then there's no way to rest our eye. And I saw that he has got this very solid tile just here. And, it, and I put it in, and actually I think it's really helped it kind of like say, okay, that's the solid floor. You need to have somewhere where, you, where your eye can rest. You can't go um, off into crazy land everywhere. So the same with actually the, this part of the background, really is really thick and beautiful paint. Um, but the other thing is, as I'm putting a kind of, a medley of colour, I'm really placing it down, the values can't be messy. So the values is the, the shift between lights and darks. So even though this has got, you know, a hundred colours and a hundred brush strokes, not, not the chair, but the background here, it's all still the same value. So I can go into different blues and different greens and different temperatures because it's the same value. So I think the floor is kind of bouncing light off it so it can be a little bit more liberal but even in this space where I'm drawing us in I've kept it much calmer so it, his paintings look they're very you know wild and wonderful in terms of paint but they're still really controlled and and calm and beautiful big fat brush strokes it's not all just crazy little short brush strokes and even the short brush strokes have masses of purpose to them they're really you know concentrated little accents so I think as he was painting he was a hundred percent in the zone. Um, I definitely know when I'm landscape painting, you can be completely in the zone and someone, you don't realise that someone's been standing behind you watching you at all. And it you know, it's, can be quite frightening because they take you out of, out of that space. And as you kind of unify the paint, 
you know, so say you think the paint is a bit too jittery, there's a massive difference between um, flattening the paint and unifying. So unifying is when you make the transition from a light to a dark or from two colours more subtle, but it's, um, it doesn't mean you kind of, you don't want to smudge it with a soft brush. Never, never use a brush to just work the paint on top of it. Always use paint to work the paint in the relationship. You know, he definitely wouldn't have gone out there at the end with a fan brush and started feathering everything. That's, that's you know, 19th century, early 18th century France. That's not, it's not his era. And the reason why I step back is because I'm looking at the painting as a whole. I'm look not looking at the little subjects. I'm looking at the whole picture and how the whole relates to each other. Also, I'd say like you're probably a little bit more like if you're painting an onion setup or a chair, you might be a little bit more precious about the drawing of the chair. Whilst the wall is a very good or the floor is a really good way to teach you to be brave and express yourself with the amount of paint you put down because you're going to be less um, precious and in particular about that. So um, don't start, you know, with the end subject. You know, start knowing that there's a rhythm and a pattern to the painting. You're slowly building up the information. I think the other thing with um, oil painting is I've never really, um, you know, studied Van Gogh per se. Um, you know, I, I love studying all artists, but you learn so much from each artist that you that you want to study in the history of art. So don't ever just stay in your ways and your habits. You know, really try and get as much as you can from every artist. So as he as he is, you know, in my mind the king of colour and expressionistic colour and emotive colour. You know, use that. Really think that that's what I want to gain from this. I want to learn to use paint and use colour. Don't think that this is about getting a perfect drawing, you know, and perfect value relationships. It's much more about, you know, experimenting with a loaded brush. And I think with most artists, the kind of Sometimes in the history of art you hear, you know, and the final brushstroke was. Well, we never know what the final brushstroke was, but often I think the final brushstroke is the call for a cup of tea or a glass of wine or the doorbell ringing. It's, it's not something really kind of um, uh, impressive and exciting, you know, especially as we know that he added this element and this three months later, so he would have sat with the painting. And, you know, the fact that it was three months later, he would have been happy with it. And then he added those elements. So a painting is a, a continuous kind of exciting dialogue, especially when you use, um, when you paint and all you're painting is the subject matter, then, you know, the subject matter is the dialogue. Whereas when you're painting and the colour is the subject and the paint handling is the subject, then the painting carries on living forever. You know, it's, it's permanently exciting. You can always be excited and notice new things that aren't the, um, the obvious apparent subject. So the more you paint, the more you kind of get drawn in and sucked into your painting and you see more things to, to do and to, and to edit. But you mustn't also let your painting get muddy. You've also got to have a freshness to it. So your paintings, my paintbrushes are still, you know, I've got my, my two reds, my two yellows, my greens. They're different temperatures and slightly different values. And my palette is still kind of really nicely clear where the, the greens are and the reds and the yellows because that's really what the, the overall balances and, and the and the colour harmonies and there's a certain stage you can feel like if I carry on I might just be killing the paint surface and making it muddy so you could um, you know be really fun to keep building up the paint but um, also you can also be happy and just think you know I've, I've learned what I need to learn from from this lesson. So how do you know when you finish the painting? So I think you the the painting process is, is not about getting a final, finished, polished product. It's about having an exercise that you complete. So today's exercise was about thinking about Van Gogh and the way he used paint and the way he used colour and translating that onto the paint and onto the paint surface. So you could carry on pulling it up and really polishing it, but the, the exercise was to use his colours and to use his huge amounts of paint and represent, you know, translate what we had in front of us onto the canvas. So now it's your turn and I'm going to set you an exercise where we fulfil what we did this morning. So I'd like you to think of a setup, a setup that's similar to Van Gogh, 
not in terms of subject matter, but more in terms of the colours, as that's his main focus. And it's not even about realistic colour, it's using colour to make the painting more exciting, to really bring it to the foreground, so exaggerating the colour and really enjoying it. So at the end of the session, you should have lots of paint and lots of colour on your palette and most importantly, on your canvas. Good luck. <laughs>